Carson, Leno, Fallon. Now, it's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are in studio today, the beautiful Southern California day. About to have a conversation with Christian Madalena. Introductions in just a moment. Hey, have a listen to Elizabeth Tang Yi. She is a a winemaker up in the the very top of the Spring Mountain in Napa Valley. Incredible conversation. It takes a dirt road to get there. But a a stoic woman with an incredible viewpoint on what her job is as a winemaker up there. Have a listen as well. Maureen Downey, that episode is out. She is the preeminent authority on counterfeit wine. And we're going to talk about that today with Christian. Have a listen to that. Please subscribe. And if you don't have anything nice to say, uh, then don't say anything at all. But if you have something nice, go ahead and give me a thumbs up and a nice rating. <laughs> That's what we, what we want to do. But uh, not while we're here today, have a conversation with Christian Madalena. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you, Paul. I'm glad so to be here. You're the, I didn't catch the title, the Export Director of Ciro Pacenti. Yes, indeed. Uh, nevertheless, here to give a precise title is a little bit difficult yeah, because right. it's a family run property. Therefore, I do support, uh, work closely with Giancarlo and my other colleague, Barbara, mostly in handling uh, foreign partnerships, uh, but also supporting all the commercial side of sales, uh, marketing, and development. So I'll just call you a jack of all trades. You do everything. Yeah. Is it, it's that small a group, and you've got Giancarlo as the owner. Giancarlo is the owner. Giancarlo is the vigneron. Giancarlo is the master of the house. Uh, even wow. though probably at his home his wife uh, rules, uh, but in the vineyard certainly he's the point of reference for all his team. Uh, we have other two people working in the office, but yes, in this is a family-run operation as early as it was founded and set up when he was a pure farm uh, with his father and grandfather. That's amazing. This is Brunello Montalcino, Brunello, the town of Montalcino. Brunello is, I mean, for the listeners, is a, one of the noble wines of Italy uh, outside of Tuscany or in Tuscany, actually. Uh, tell me about Brunello, though, as a region, as a part of the wine world. As, what does it bring to the table for us? But certainly, I appreciate the recognition to, that you gave to the area. And I do agree with you that in the Italian scene of production, Brunello is one of the point of reference of quality, certainly together with Barolo. It is produced from a grape that uh, is Sangiovese, that is one of the most noble grape varieties with Nebbiolo going north or probably Aianico going south uh, that give you naturally wine uh, that uh, are a pure expression of terroir, but also have a natural longevity to age and improve over time. Uh, We could call it an A grape, if you allow me, in the Italian scene. Um, And Brunello di Montalcino, and in Montalcino is one of the few places, if not the few places, where the grape performs at very high level uh, since uh, more than 150 years bottled on his own as a pure expression. In the rest of Tuscany, the tendency and the history was always of blending. So in the terroirs and in the microclimatic condition of Montalcino, the grape has its own natural expression as a single variety. It's uh, Sangiovese, you know, th- I read this an article recently and it, it confused me a little bit because, uh, you know, you would say it's Sangiovese Grosso, okay, which is, uh, you know, species are uh, some kind of part of some type of, of, of Sangiovese. Is that accurate or are there more than one type of Sangiovese that goes into a Brunello. Uh, let me start saying that your confusion is nothing uh, unusual. We are Italians. We like to confuse people. <laughs> well, you only have 2,000 wine grapes. Exactly. So. <laughs> and uh, Sangiovese is a great variety, widely grown from the center, from Romagna down until the south, reaching the northern parts of Puglia. In its expression, have a multiplicity of uh, biotypes uh, that uh, have been there in some cases for thousands of years mm-hmm. and have certainly become a different expression of the same grape or at least the same grape, mother grape that gave the origin to various different expressions. Sangiovese Grosso is a way to more a nickname, I would refer to, mm-hmm. to the grape variety from the area. It comes from the wider family of Tuscan Sangiovese and was referred as such because the, the biotype that existed in that area used to produce darker grapes, a little bit larger in their content, probably more juicy for some ways, but also with a thicker skin. Therefore, the higher level of tannins that are often associated with the Sangiovese from that area. Nevertheless, the original name that you will find across Tuscany for around 100 years in the 19th century and the beginning of that was Sangioveto, and it was referred as Sangioveto Grosso across the entire Tuscany. Sangioveto? Sangioveto, absolutely. And the differentiation came more once the product started becoming more commercial, I would say in the post-war period, 
the Sangiovese Grosso was a firm that was acquired more locally from Montalcino uh, to differentiate themselves from the bottlings that were occurring in Chianti Classico in the 50s and 60s with Sangiovese, where those products were certainly more commercially driven, uh, the packaging was still the flask and so forth, while uh, in Montalcino there was an aristocratic consideration of the wine, not produce every vintage, uh, only bottled in the best one, and as a single expression of the variety. You know, it's interesting, uh, and I, I want to touch on the fact that you have a PhD in history. Uh, yeah, and what part of history? Uh, it's a little bit of a tricky subject nowadays. I'm specialized <laughs> in the philosophy of the far-right movements of the 30s and how they affected British society in that period. So it's so very this, specialized. This, this, uh, that's a really granular uh, subject. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. <laughs> but I, you're the second PhD, Italian PhD, that I've had on the show in the last two weeks, yeah. uh, which tends to lend itself to the study of wine, and obviously you're uh, so far already with your knowledge of the background of the grape, uh, you know, suggest your your curiosity to history. And here now you're applying at the wine, which is fascinating because I think so much of wine is history and so much is a story. Um, the, my dad's shop in the picture you see there in 1975, yeah, Chianti, classical Chianti, it was in a fiasco, you know, the, the wicker basket uh, didn't carry with it necessarily a pedigreed, um, a moniker of wine, uh, you know, it was just a bottle of wine. It was Italian, and that's that's the way the Americans drank it in the, in the 70s and 80s, right? And Brunello's emerged as this uh, a, a fine wine and a noble wine. But was Brunello always in that sort of position amongst Tuscan wines as sort of, you know, a preeminent part of the world? Or did it suffer also in the 70s, 60s and 70s from sort of an identity crisis? I will be a little bit controversial right now, and I hope yeah, that my, co I, my colleagues about. would not hear me now because <laughs> I have a little bit of a personal point of view about this. Uh, Brunello, as uh, they were Barolo, they were fine wines and noble wines in Italy in the 50s and 60s, but consumption was not occurring with these wines. Mm -hmm. There was a revolution of quality that occurred during the 70s and 80s that transformed this wine into be at the level of our colleagues in France or aspiring to that. In those years, the wine certainly had a potentiality, spoke about the terroir as very few other wines uh, could do, but they were wines that were a niche category, often uh, maybe gifts that were exchanged uh, uh, to your lawyer, to your best friend, but then put in a corner in your cellar, while in Piemonte they were drinking Dolcetto and Barbera, and in Tuscany they were drinking Chianti Classico for the everyday consumption. During the 70s and 80s, certainly across all of Italy, there was a quality revolution, in, uh, in uh, Montalcino, this quality revolution was driven, sadly enough, from outsiders, in a sense. I must, not, I, I must be very frank about that. The influence that Banfi had in the area was something that uh, was, is, it is not to be undermined at all. Today, Banff is certainly a commercial brand, mm -hmm. but in the 70s, in some ways, uh, it brought a new, fresh vision of technological advances of winemaking, really? as well as a commercial approach to the market that created the brand of Montalcino. At the same time, other producers were certainly researching and improving the techniques that were the same on since 80, 90 years in the cellar and bringing these wines to a different level. But in reality, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, uh, the wine still was a very niche style of wine. You needed 10, 15 years to drink it in the best vintages. The number of producers were very few. Consider that the explosion of production in the area occurred in the 90s and 2000s. A lot of new implants for this region. reason. We will speak later on about our age of vineyards. Yet uh, by that time, uh, certainly the number of producers in the 80s were probably 30 or 40s. Among these many bottlers, through producers, uh, farm or vineyard as we intend them, you could count them in the number of 10, 15. Wow. Today, there's around 200 and more really? wow. registered bottling so bottlers in the area. Yeah. Does, does Brunello, or maybe this is your job uh, for not only the winery that, uh, for Ciro Pacenta, but uh, Pacenti, Pacenti, right? Pacenti, Pacenti. Pacenti. Um, maybe this is your job is to continue to wave the flag of Brunello. Does Brunello still suffer from a lack of recognition throughout the world of wine or is it getting more traction? No, certainly this, I say it to hope, hopefully with no arrogance today, Brunello has a worldwide consideration yeah. uh, at the same level of Barolo and the great other uh, wines of the world. 
the issue it is and often happen once uh, uh, these products achieve this level of international recognition there is certain one segment of production that tend to exploit that therefore over the years you find that more labels or commercial style product that are both as brunello with all the respectful of the denomination but they don't come from a vineyard they're not family oriented wines uh, uh, grapes that have been bought and so forth to fit in a specific category but uh, on a global scale and I've been lucky to be part of this process uh, that I go to Southeast Asia or South America, Iceland or, or uh, Russia, the recognition of Brunello being one of the top points of Italy is indisputable. The reason I asked the question, uh, I went to a tasting the other day, I tasted a Barolo that I had never tasted before, I hadn't even seen it before, a particular label had a very distinctive look. Uh, I happened an hour later to be at a friend's house. We had hosted a wine tasting the night before together. Somebody brought her a bottle of wine and left it on the counter. She couldn't decide who, who brought the wine. She was about to throw it away. She was, I'm going to throw this away. I don't know who brought it. I mean, literally, because she's, uh, she's very stoic about her wine consumption. But she decided to use one of the apps and take a picture of the label. And it was a very famous Barolo, the one I had just tasted an hour before. And she says, oh, my God, this is $350 a bottle. I said, yeah, I just tasted it. Literally, it's a Brunate, it's, you know, the famed district. Uh, but it had been labeled on the shoulder with a strip label saying, Red Piemonte Dessert Wine. Wow. That's cl it clearly wasn't. It was a 2004. And, and so what, what, what the point I'm trying to make is not the story, except that She's a drinker. She knows the wine enough to what she likes, and she's willing to experiment. She sees the name Barolo doesn't ring a bell with her. And then, of course, there's a vineyard designate on there, but ready to throw it away, not understanding what it was. And I'm wondering uh, if, if the, the, the tier of educated consumer still is grasping with the many Italian varietals and regions to deal with. Sure. I certainly, first of all, your story moves me a little bit. It's sad, and this also I take it as a lesson that probably us as Italian producers should still continue and not give things to grant and continue to invest on education and mm -hmm. tell our story. Mm -hmm. We are a certainly a massive country to produce volume wines, and the volume of production of Italy is extremely large. Yet again, we have not invested as the French did for many years, and the Spaniards are catching up very quickly in tell our story and broader story. Often our stories are more individualistic. We promote right. ourselves, our winery, we don't speak about our area of origin, our terroir, and so on. On the other hand, if you allow me, I do think that the comparison here are quite particular because you quote Barolo, and Barolo is certainly a more niche type of category. Brunello benefits not only from its history, but uh, being an appellation from Tuscany, mm -hmm. a region that has a touristic appeal. Uh, Florence, uh, one of the cities that are most visited uh, by international tourists, in particular Americans, there's a long connection with American tourists going to visit Florence. Hence that love, indirect or direct, with various things that are Tuscan. In that is the olive oil, in that is the Chianti Classico, and in that comes from a more savvy and educated consumer uh, Brunello. Sure. Barolo is much more uh, a not obscure region, but a region not on your common touristic trap, uh, tr track. That's true. I would say that is more an enogastronomic en region to visit. doesn't have the same art, the culture that Florence portrayed and has too. So it's more for a niche consumer and highly educated consumer. Yeah. But they have Nutella. They have Nutella, absolutely. <laughs> so, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right, though. And I had a Friulian in yesterday, a good friend of mine, Max Lewis. We were talking about that one. I want to discuss that briefly. But um, he was saying that tourism right now in Italy is very big. It's really, this it, has been a great season. It is booming. It's been a great season. If you would come to Florence, but even secondary, secondary region compared to the usual tourist uh, 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 track or, or tour have uh, been uh, it's been a full house despite all the challenges that you heard on the news it's interesting that you quoted Friuli because Friuli is a region that uh, probably had a touristic appeal more to neighboring countries Austrians Slovenia Yugoslavia because of the similarities mm -hmm. because the vicinity but nowadays as we're communicating more uh, Friuli is not far from Venice and so forth the region has has been able to attract a different type of tourist that is coming from different parts of the world for sure. But yes, Italy was a full house this summer. It was crazy.
Well, we're going <laughs> next week, so. <laughs> and I plan on, you know, I haven't been for many, many years. I've been to Vin Italy twice and uh, in Tuscany once prior to that. Uh, so I'm excited to go back and see what's happening. I'm going to go see my good friend Valentino Valentini in, in Montefalco, uh, the ex-mayor, and we're going to tour the town and do those things. So I'm look, excited for that. But it's interesting for me because there's so many varieties in, in, in Italy. Another friend of mine, Massimo Alwa in the Campania, whose task is to find these ancient varieties of grapes and produce wine from them and see what we get. And I it's very intriguing for a guy like me who's sees from the outside what what can happen. But you were you were I want to touch on this a little bit because Friuli is a very interesting part of the wine world. It's not well known amongst uh, aficionados even at the top of the Adriatic, kind of arches over from Italy to Slovenia to the base of the Dolomites. It, and you were selling wine from there for a long time. What's the difference between trying to educate? the wine world on a Friulian wine, which is obscure and not well-known, and a Brunello wine, which is more. And thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me and I had to work for many years in Friuli with a great family, a family that made the history of the wines from the region in the world. And uh, certainly the differences are very, very, very steep. When I approach a uh, uh, buyer or speak about Brunello, I, ca I immediately catch the attention of uh, an array of consumers that tend to be on the premium side, if not collectors, uh, the top restaurant uh, list will be made up of Brunello and so forth, at the equal category of Bordeaux, Burgundy or, or, or uh, Champagne, mm -hmm. that would be the kind of idea on the premium list. Truly today suffers a little bit of a lack of education, but it's probably, if you allow me, and this again, not out of arrogance, but out of facts, uh, probably under an ampelographical point of view, one of the most interesting wine regions on the really? world. Why is that? If you consider the top production in a region and in appellation usually happens with a few number of varieties, if not one. Uh, Bergen is, uh, is a Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. In Bordeaux, you have Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, just to quote a few. In, in the Rhone, it's Syrah Grinache. In uh, Piemonte, you have Barbera and Biolo as the focus. In, in Tuscany, it's mainly Sangiovese. When you are in Friuli, you have an array of varieties that produce at high quality level, both whites and reds, that mm -hmm. you cannot find anywhere else. For the indigenous whites, you have Malvasia, Friulano, you have Ribolla Gialla, you have Pinot Bianco, you have Sauvignon, you have Chardonnay. On the other side of the reds, you have Refosco, Cabernet Franc, Merlot. Probably the only region that comes in my mind that have some similarities is Alsace especially with the white wow. grapes. That's interesting. But yeah. then on the red grapes, they only produce Pinot Noir at high quality standard. Right. While Friuli has the possibility, even in reds, to offer you six, seven different examples of fine wines at the highest level. And the, the reason here is very simple. It was a crossroad of culture. Therefore, uh, it, uh, there's been an influence and an influx of different cultures in that region over the past millennia that have brought uh, varieties coming from outside, uh, French in origin or Balkanic. You had your own breed of uh, indigenous variety that sprang out there. You had mutation of varieties like Sauvignon that was coming from Bordeaux that became a Sauvignon on its own and cannot be classified in the general scale of it. So it has this kind of interesting apelographic side. Educate on that is quite complicated. Complex in one way, but also complicated because nowadays people need uh, uh, more easy, short communication. And to speak about this story, sometimes uh, you need the people that are curious, uh, that have that degree of adventureness uh, that uh, usually you don't find in it. But, that, but that's no different than what you're doing today, except that, yeah, Brunello is more well known, but you got to hand sell this story of Gio Giancarlo um, and hand sell the story of Montalcino even at some point. I mean, Friuli is a, a tougher sell because it's less known. And so my question to this gentleman yesterday was, I get a lot of alternative packaging ideas through here. I have a lot of conversations with people that are trying to create something new in the world of wine. And I, I strongly disagree and I strongly have problems with the idea that packaging is something new for wine. That's not what wine's about. It's about what's in the glass, not or. And so the question I asked him was, do you think you'll ever find a Friulian wine in a can? In other words, will it ever get so mainstream that they put it in a can? And he's, he actually thought that there might happen. And I don't want wine in a can. I don't agree with that concept. 
And I, but as a benchmark as to its popularity, you know, is that a real benchmark? No, just... it's not a benchmark. And these uh, trends uh, scare me in a sense. Uh, we are a country that should invest on quality and not that. Uh, and the example of these are categories like Pinot Grigio or Prosecco, where there are peaks of quality there, but the general perception are to be commercial items that should cost cheap and the exploitation of those grapes or name of origin have been then transformed into something that commercial products very far away of what it is, their origin and their history as well in its sense. And that's I'm, very sad. That was very articulate in what you said. And what you're fighting against, because mm. I'm with you on this, mm -hmm. is I had a, I'm going to have a podcast with a Cornell professor of that same subject. His job is to create and test and find can liners that would propagate wine. Mm -hmm. And the scary part about the conversation I had with them before was we are approaching liners that can last 24 months. Well, that's a little scary, right? Right now they're only like six months. So what's happening after the seventh month or what's gonna happen on the 25th month? What's happening to the wine? And you're right, it's not gonna ever express what you're trying to do today with this Brunello is where it's coming from. So your your proprietor, your proprietaire in French, um, it, it sounds like based on our previous conversation that his goal is to present the best Brunello he can produce from the soil that he's given. Absolutely, yes. Giancarlo's commitment to that in the last 40 years has been undoubtful. He, he's, he, he comes from a farming family in some ways, poor and humble, and uh, they taught him on one side the respect of the environment where you work, first and furthermore. But they also left him a legacy of older vineyards that allowed Giancarlo from the beginning of his career as a vigneron, when he invented himself at the, in, during the 80s, to work uh, with vineyards that were extremely well integrated in the soil and already were telling the story of that land. Giancarlo became an interpreter of that and he has strived over the years to improve uh, the way he could do that. Uh, uh, with the use of technology, with the use of know-how, with the use of uh, an approach that for some people would have been defined modernist, but in the same way has been a way that uh, have brought the winery and the area as well to thrive to achieve that quality. Among some of his colleagues, he's a representative of uh, uh, a style of Montalcino, which is the one that should be portrayed by everybody. Unfortunately, as I said, the, the brand Montalcino has an appeal also to create a lot of commercial products that are very different to, to, to what it should be. That is the first time I've heard that term, and I think it's rather insightful, and that is the interpreter of that land. That, that you, that's what you are. It is, sir, and I probably have been, again, a little bit uh, uh, mischievous in what I said, because uh, <laughs> here we could start another debate. Uh, wine is made by men. And uh, it is the culture, the education of, uh, of men in winemaking that allow us today to drink wines of this type of level. Uh, nevertheless, uh, looking and respecting what we have, what has been done behind, and most importantly, looking and respecting terroir, looking and respecting the expression of the variety and so forth. Sangiovese in the Brunello expression is a wine that needs time. How you achieve that, that time, it is uh, working in the vineyard, trying to express a uh, uh, good level and balance acidity, a good character, all elements that will give a structure to, to the wine to then spend two years in wood. It's a long time, mm -hmm. two years in the bottle, even before release on the wine. But the objective of that is to age 20, 30 years. The greatest wines ever made in this history have that kind of potentiality. And we should not uh, 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 forget that ever. And that uh, it's only achieved through a process of uh, interpreting and understanding the land where they're coming from. Fascinating word to use for a winemaker because the, the question I often ask is what's, what is the end game? What are we taking profitability out of the question? The, the passion and the creativity, the artistry it takes to create, a, and I'm going to use this term, you're using the highest level of wine. You know, you, every year you're trying to do something new and different to completely advance that expression, to advance that interpretation. If you allow me, different is not a term that I would use because in winemaking you need time. Mm -hmm. So every, every year you're trying to improve, you're trying to learn from what has happened the previous years, and you're trying to continue to strive to do better rather than uh, do different. 
time also is necessary because uh, uh, Giancarlo is not a self-made man. He certainly studied, but every year a vigneron and learns from the previous year what he has done good and what he has done bad. Therefore, he needs time to also understand why, what is the final result of what he did good, how can affect uh, this fine in time. So in the case of Giancarlo, to give you an example, nowadays we're using also some cement vats, uh, temperature control that have been designed by him. I have, I have heard having this conversation with somebody else that that was probably a fashionable choice by him because a lot of people are turning to cement. Yes. Giancarlo experimented for 10 years before using yeah, cement really. tanks <laughs> to see what those were doing to his wines. So he separated some batch, uh, therefore took out sales and profitability for the wines he had in the cellar, isolated these batches in these uh, this tanks after the aging of the wood to see what would have done in the wine and gradually introduced uh, at every year uh, with the more stages or more length in time that we'll spend in that cement ta- tank, that part of batch into his final blend of the wine. Why? Because the effect of what we do today in winemaking, we can see it only in the years. The immediate things are perceivable immediately, but for wine as such, we need to look at the long run. I wonder if the, I was in Armenia in 2006, and I can tell you it's a completely different world, but the wines were literally unpalatable, could not drink them. And that's because the Soviets had taken over and what all the problems. Now they're making wine again. And I, I brought this up earlier that sort of a, it's a new world expression of old world wine because they, they've been making wine for thousands of years, but they've just only now restarted it, right? But when I was there in 2006, we went to a winery, couldn't drink it, but it was a concrete vat. It was, but I don't think it was meant to, add complexity or decide, you know, what we can, what component it can add to another bottle of wine. It was just, that's all they had. And, you know, there was cracks in it and there was repair marks in it. And that was just it. Then on the flip side, somebody like Piero Vincenza, who goes to Patagonia and redesigns a vat to maximize the biodynamic expression of his wines. And I wonder if that's just a reflection on really, really old techniques like amphora. I mean, it's clay. They didn't have concrete back then. It's just it, going back to the roots of winemaking. It's a very complex conversation now that we're having because I would say it's not a way of going back to the roots. But first of all, you're right. The extensive use of concrete in the past, and this goes also in Tuscany, uh, was, uh, was because that was the vessel most affordable, often the largest one that you can have without having inve- in, to invest in wood, right, which was sure. the alternative at the time. Let's not forget that steel tanks were introduced uh, in the post-war period in Italy for light production. They were not available, and they were a revolution coming from the new world, much more than ours. So concrete was solving that solution. The problem of concrete, as you said, and you have noticed with the producer in Armenia, it's that if not kept at very high standards, and we didn't have the knowledge before, it's a material that have a tendency to crack. Everything that goes in there, then it's an unhealthy environment, which then will affect the wine. Right. So over time, that explains it. <laughs> over time, when when we learn and we started looking at uh, uh, with a careful eye in producing better wines, uh, uh, concrete was substituted by steel tanks because it gave you an aseptic environment in a right. sense. Uh, to give you an idea of who it is, Giancarlo, before we go maybe in detail after. Uh, this is a man that uh, once introduced these uh, this concrete tanks, uh, spent uh, to me around f- five hours explaining me how he cleans it inside. Wow. Uh, his technique and his kind of level of research on how wow. to achieve the perfect uh, healthy environment for his wine, because otherwise he would not have used that kind of, uh, of, of supplement. So I do think that now concrete, what he's offering, is offering an alternative solution to steel tanks, a better, technically speaking, solution to it, but then they, they know how on how to use it is fundamental. So I do think more that it is a technological advances that as many others that we had in the past, we need to learn more how to use it. And barrique is the same thing. Yes. Or wooden vats in mm. Italy in the 80s is the same thing. Everybody introduced those woods because it was a fashionable thing to do, but many of these producers had no real knowledge on how to use them and what would have been the effect on the wines over time. And we see it now in some of those bottles that didn't age as they should have done. I guess it's just humanism. Uh, and I've, I'll refer to Armenia again, because we're going, I'm going back there on this trip to Tuscany as well. And I'm helping them with some of the business side of the industry that they're wrestling with. But um, 
I don't think the grape that they grow there, Arani, likes oak very much. I don't think it does well. I think it needs to be, you know, more a less traditional method, but they can't help it because you're supposed to put wine and oak. In all the great vintages of the world, they put wine and oak. And I finally had one of the great winemakers there agree with me on a podcast. You're right. It doesn't like oak. There's other grapes in Armenia that like oak, but our egos are telling us we got to put it in oak. And it sounds like Giancarlo's passion, because if, if it takes five hours to explain how he cleans it, I mean, how long does it take to clean it? Yeah. And at what end is that? What's the goal? Well, he wants to produce the highest level of wine that he can. And it takes a lot of passion and effort to do that. And so with that question, what does that mean, the highest level of wine? What, what, what's that concept? You use it a few times. Is the free he makes high level wines. Uh, you know, the best, the, let's say the classified growth Bordeaux. Highest, is that an expression of the terroir? Is that an expression of the winemaker? Is that an expression of just the pure energy it takes to put it together? It's certainly a combination of all those that. things that you have said, but in particular, a wine that, uh, first of all, has balance, elegancy, and one factor that sometimes we forget about it is drinkability. In the last 20, 30 years, uh, the industry has become also very fashionable, and some wines have been produced more to impress rather than to be drunk. And that's sad, because the greatest it bottle of sad. wine is the one that is finished. Uh, the best wine on the table is the one where the glass is finished. So drinkability is an important factor of it. I add on that age abilities for sure. I add about a good uh, high quality expression or the highest quality expression should be varietable, recognizable. Therefore should have those character of the variety as well as, as you, we said, the land of origin. These are probably the only three characteristics that in a very subjective uh, 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 thing like this wine, objectively we can, say, we can say make a great wine. Everything else after that is more personal. You know, that's the, the funniest thing anyone has ever said. You don't even know why it's so funny. Mm. You said the best wine are the wines that's finished. The gla empty glass, mm. right? And that's, that's the, that has got to be the most root basic test, <laughs> right? And a guest came over, and was one of my closest friends, so I can say whatever I want to him. And he's a learned wine guy. He's learning more. He brought a bottle of wine. And he is Armenian wine again. And he said, this is good wine. I said, really? It's, let's taste it. We taste it. It's, again, the same problem that most of them have. And I, half hour later, the glass was still mostly full. And I go, now what do you think? I said, you told me it was good wine. You haven't even finished it. You haven't even, got, you haven't even taken a sip since you first said that. And he goes, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's a great test. It's a great test. You know, one of, one of the things that's happened with me um, uh, doing this, and I was in the direct-to-consumer world for 35 years, tasted 100,000 wines, heard 100,000 stories. The show started because you would, someone like you would walk in from Italy and tell me a story. I'm like, why are we wasting this story? We should record these stories. And along with that has become this great education for me on geography and on the history of people, the history of wine. Uh, I know all about Napoleon. I know about his girlfriend. You know, uh, Pierre and Chance's grandfather. Is this an important part of the storytelling that you that you bring to the table? That when you go out and you're traveling the world, how many days a year are you traveling? Like two hundred? Much more. Much more. Much more. <laughs> it's, it's so, um, you have to tell the stories, and is that what is going to differentiate Giancarlo's wines, along with the course what's in the bottle, for people to be excited, inspired, and educated to do it? In, in, in my case, a fundamental part when I say the story is certainly the story of the family as a whole. Now, according to the audience that I'm talking to, I might start to, to speak about the area first and then speak about the geography and the history and then bring it to the family. Mm -hmm. When there is a knowledge of that, uh, I will start speaking about the family, but then still go back to the area because I need to go back explaining the peculiarities of our vineyards and so forth. So certainly these two things are linked together. The, the, the important part it is that we are not storytellers. We are actually talking about something that is relevant, something that for me, it's, uh, it's culture as well. It's part of mm -hmm. our intrinsic history. Since millennia, wines have been part of our culture in some ways, uh, and it's associated to people coming together, to people enjoying time. Uh, and that uh, function should not be forgotten. Uh, today, we have achieved a more specific level of it, and 
the families that uh, are able to bring that quality in the glass uh, are part uh, integral of that story and should be said. In the case of Giancarlo, for me, it's fundamental. He's the vigneron. He's the person that physically makes the wine. He's the person that physically transforms a farm into one of the most prestigious, sorry if I say it, Giancarlo would not say, but I can, prestigious winery in the area with an international recognition. So his personal story, but also his vigneron story is important to be said. Because we, not every district in the world has that story. I mean, the American is not a story. It's brand new compared to the rest of the world when it comes to wine. And, and for my company, I wanted people to get a bottle of wine from me. And my objective was maybe like Giancarlo's. I wanted them to say, wow, take that bottle to a friend's house, have that friend say, wow, and have that person tell them the story. Oh, I got this wine from the guy his father started in 1972. He's been tasting wine for his old life, whatever the story is. Because how, how else do we differentiate ourselves from Groupon wines for $5 a bottle, uh, one of the big uh, direct-to-consumer companies in America, Wink, they went bankrupt after $250 million in sales because their stuff was bad, but they put it in a night package and they sold it for $6. So it seems to me the story is the difference in the history of the region. And, and the work of certainly, the work behind. Yeah. So the story, it is important. Uh, the story, not only, what you said is true, wines of this sort uh, are, are, are consumed more because word of mouth rather than branding, more because the appreciation of what they represent, right. more because they have that story, but that story is also perceivable in the glass. Uh, you, you, we could stay here talking hours, Paul, and so forth, but if that wine, as we said, does not have that quality in the glass, all my stories would not be supported <laughs> what there is true. there. So uh, they are intrinsically uh, uh, entangled and they cannot be separated. I think that's why the company went bankrupt, I could say. <laughs> <laughs> because they, they had the story, but it didn't pan out in the glass. Well, that's actually a very interesting point. And I had this conversation just before you arrived with a winemaker in in Sonoma, and that is, well, there's more to the beverage that's in this bottle than the, the what the word terroir might might suggest. In other words, yes, we can take the climate, the picking conditions, the, the phenolic ripeness, all the things that go into winemaking, but I think that terroir includes this history, this whatever Giancarlo has learned, whatever his winemakers learned, wherever his winemaker came from, whatever his assistant winemaker came from, whatever history you bring, back to the table, whatever you go out and you're in Korea and you hear something from a Korean buyer and you come back and tell Giancarlo, say, this is what I'm hearing, that that ultimately, maybe it's not a piece of tannin, but it's something that's expressed in this final bottle. So terroir includes the human Absolutely. part of this. And I do think it's a fundamental part that nowadays we forgot some time. I think so. I, I give an example, Paul. I just drafted with Giancarlo a new presentation on the property. I was supported by somebody that is better to me to work with communication. And I had to correct very often her romantic way of portraying the winemaking and the procedures that we were doing at the property as she avoided to use the term of human intervention and so forth because it was more romantic. Uh, nowadays, there is that tendency sometimes. There are some terminology about natural wine and so forth. Nature doesn't do wine. Nature does vinegar. It is our knowledge of the last thousands of years that allow us to make great wine as right. such. Yes. And the human impact of that is fundamental and is a continual dynamic learning process. The levels of sulfite that they were in Champagne in the 19th century would be legal in every single country in the yeah. world nowadays because that's how they control a system which now we are able to control thanks to the scientific advances that we did without forgetting that science should not guide that process but uh, we need to reduce, and that's what we have done over the years, that uh, scientific dependency, but use science to the advantage to make great pure wine as much as possible with no chemical intervention and so forth. But nature doesn't do wine. That's something I, I that, need to do a stand on. That's a great comment. Uh, and I, you know, in America, the word natural wine is, you know, I know it's a bunch of uh, uh, horse, uh, horse hockey. <laughs> Sort of an American term, maybe from the 40s that term came from. Um, <clears throat> but natural doesn't exist. It's not even a word uh, uh, in, in the Federal Drug Administration. Doesn't you, you can use the word natural. It has no definition. And I'm so glad you said it that way because 
uh, yeah, it'll turn to vinegar. It's not, we have to intervene. It's, it is people driven to do this. Um, and w what I heard you say though, under inside there was that. Don't get me in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think it's probably too late for that anyway, but <laughs> no, what the, the idea of natural wine is that it's untouched on, 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 uh, adulterated by people. And, and for me, wine was always natural in that sense, in that definition. It was, we didn't have the things that they were throwing. They were saying in, sul in, in the turn of the century, you know, the French Revolution, possibly there was lots of sulfur, but uh, that was the control, you know, the stability. But for the most part, um, the wine process is natural in, in the sense of it's ferment fermenting grape sugar into alcohol. And we didn't need to add a bunch of stuff to it. We didn't need to use defoaming agents. We didn't need to add, you know, mega red or mega purple, whatever it's called, because they weren't around, right? And so there's nothing new about the idea of natural. It's always been around. I mean, look in Brunello in the 30s, they weren't using those things, right? In the 20s, they didn't know what they were. The Bordelais invented, you know, copper sulfate like in 1945 or something, right? So, so what is this movement about? Because we're really nothing new, in my opinion. And the term natural is says, but do you, do you agree with that? Or do you think that there's more to this idea and what I'm getting to, I'm kind of long-winded here. Some wineries are using this idea of natural to create wines that taste like kombucha. They're not pleasant to drink, but people think they're drinking them because they're doing something good for themselves. And it's not a health beverage. It's not for your health. It's, I mean, it is to a certain extent, but it's not, you don't drink it because you think you're having a, an immunity shot. Hmm. You drink it for the pleasure of drinking it. So what is your take on this term natural? And what is, what is Giancarlo doing? I, I told you you were going to get in trouble. <laughs> now, uh, let's, it's, uh, even this is a complicated uh, conversation to be made. And sometimes as you portrayed it and ask for, it's too much simplistic or consumers and people approach it in that way. You said something that scares me because that's true. Uh, to, nowadays you have uh, some uh, producers and I have the maximum respect for the work and so forth but start a conversation saying my wine is natural uh, to the portray time. themselves and fit themselves in a specific category. Yeah. Now, I'll give you an idea of the background of Giancarlo. So in some ways I avoid also to, to be provocative, but so forth. We work at biodynamic standards. Mm -hmm. We're not registered. We're not interested in classification. And Giancarlo has done that for decades, yeah. decades. Now, his vineyard are of a certain age. And when he inherited these vineyards, uh, they had no need of uh, chemical support uh, for their immune system. Why? Because his father didn't use it. But his father and grandfather most likely didn't use it because they were poor farmers. They could not afford those chemicals. They had to work with what they had. Wow. What they did, uh, what they did, they gave to Giancarlo Vineyards uh, with 20 years, 30 years uh, that lived uh, and grew with that kind of uh, stronger immune system that helped Giancarlo avoiding since the beginning to have to support them in their further growth. So his approach of respect for the nature he had started from there. Nevertheless, certainly those standards that I described to you, organic and so forth, are the one where we have to look at for the production of wine in the future. The problem for me, Paul, is when we start categorizing, when we start putting boxes, Biodynamic laws were done during the 20s and the climate is certainly changed or the con productive conditions nowadays are not the same of before. In the same ways uh, to produce at biodynamic standards in that kind of restricted boundaries of those laws, uh, you can work very well in certain regions of the world because of the micro microclimatic condition. It's certainly more difficult to, to work in environments where Let's pick Friuli, for example, where humidity can be extremely high. Mm -hmm. The rains, it's higher. You can have problems with poronospora and so forth. We are certainly using all the natural elements and natural contribution that uh, all nature has given to us. But when once in a while, uh, you need to bound those. You still use uh, for your, those kind of supports, still organic and respectful of that, but you're outside of those laws. What does that make me? Make me somebody exploited production? No, makes me somebody that is trying to have a healthy plant. Makes you out, an outlaw. Exactly. But the, <laughs> how, the healthiness is the plant is the most important part that we do. Sure. The healthiness of that product. Of course. You quoted very much copper solution as one of the substitutes for some chemicals that were introduced in the post-war period. Now, uh, copper is a metal. 
So if I'm obliged to use only that technique and anything else that currently is not com com comprehended in those laws because it was not available by then, but is a natural element, I'm breaking those laws and I'm using more and more copper. That copper goes in the soil. Mm -hmm. We don't have analysis n in nowadays, but to my knowledge, copper is a poison for our blood. Right. So in the kind of percentage that we're more polluting that soil, it will come back in the wine and will come back to us. There's no scientific analysis now to prove that, but speaking with Giancarlo, he was telling me that w once he was only applying those techniques 15 years ago, the residual of methyl in his soils were five, six times higher than when his father was working. This is not a positive data. Wow. So being a man that is respectful of nature is also a scientific man, as I told you, that is sensitive to technology and looking at that data, that data is a, an alarm or at least something to be considered rather than anything else. Where are we going? Where are we going? I don't know. The problem is that, as I said, when we are trying to categorize and, and not have that kind of flexibility in understanding that the balance with different techniques is the one that have brought us to make step forward. Once we close and we become rigid, those techniques do not evolve. And so what we're producing is a rigid product, while wine is an alive thing. That's a, a very mature, introspective outlook because I would imagine, uh, Valentino Valentini told me this. Uh, he goes, you know, my kids are playing in that vineyard. And, you know, there's a, a great book uh, called The Third Plate by Dan Bar Barber, the famed chef in New York, about biodynamic farming in America and how we've destroyed so many plots of land and it takes many, many years for them to regenerate. And that, you know, biodynamic farming, here, the book is right here, Rudolf Steiner's book. Let's just say Giancarlo's, is applying the practices because he wants to. Absolutely. Because he, for him, it's producing a better expression of what he's trying to do. Sure. And biodiversity is a yes. very important thing. Biodiversity. Lo biodiversity. Those laws are very important in some ways because they spoke about maintaining the biodiversity of where the vineyards grow. Uh, nature is a cycle and has its own cycle. And what we have done once we planted in the wrong places, so we exploited the land, we destroyed that biodiversity. So we talk about bees now disappearing. Bees were mm -hmm. fundamental in the, in the pollinated process that we have. We have our own culture of bees. We have to bring it back because the surrounding areas are, are, around us have been planted more and more. They cut more trees, they cut uh, fields of flowers, therefore the bees disappear. So Giancarlo incentive a culture of bees in its own vineyard. We use specific medicinal herbs planted in our vineyard to absorb some elements in the soil or donate some other elements in the soil in wow. the case of fava beans and whatsoever. But again, this comes as a learning process and comes through scientific research. It doesn't come only because it's said from a rule and so forth. And years will be different. So we will plant the herbs differently according to the specific need of the, vine of the vintage. It's kind of like the human race did it to themselves by almost like Western medicine to where you are trying to address the symptom rather than the cause because certainly cross-planting uh, is probably a very ancient thing to do. And so that you plant green beans because you're, you're low on one uh, uh, chemical, not chemical, but one nutrient is another. And that seems very natural to do. And it produces a more natural product. Uh, so it seems to me that we're just going backwards, not backwards. We're actually going back to where it really makes sense and we can do it without the intervention of what would be Western medicine or Western culture. Absolutely. Some plots of our vineyards uh, 15, 17 years ago, we were realizing allies in the soil that contain a very high level of salinity, which would affect our production and yeah. so forth. And rather than using some techniques, which would have been an invasive chemical, the desalinization of the soil, which you can do, but that is true. Giancarlo planted an herb that is called Sulla. I apologize, I don't know the term in English. Yeah. And that was an herb, an aromatic herb that was used uh, by the Romans 2,000 years ago, once they bonified the swamps wow. to produce uh, and uh, introduce agriculture there because that herb had the <laughs> ability to absorb salinity. Uh, a lesson from 2,000 years ago that somewhere on the line we forgot. There, you actually, actually, this is so important because not only does that, yes, it naturally is fixing the soil, it's, it's, nutri it's providing nutrients for the vines, um, but it, it also changes the expression of the wine. And there's a story about Alain de Casse, the famed fresh chef, going to a restaurant and tasting the butter and commenting on the chef that the butter was not hand-churned. And then 
and that the cows that um, produce the milk, that produce the butter, had not grazed in fertile soil. And so we are what we eat, eats, really. Absolutely. The wine is what it's going down to those tap roots and pulling up those nutrients and where those things are coming from. Absolutely. And I think that's a critical part of what winemaking is about. Uh, you said something that just, oh, tell me about the DOC. And we're almost out of time already, which is unbelievable. But uh, for the listeners, you know, they see these appellations, you know, the French, they have theirs and the Americans don't have it. And, but you have DOC and have DOC, DOCG. How does that protect the consumer in any way? Or does it? The SDG is certainly an, an easier way to communicate uh, an area and communicate its uh, historical value, its uh, values on the reproductive point of view in some ways. Italy, for what we have said before, it's a little bit still confusing in some ways because of the large variety that, of expression of the SDG that you can find. It's an association. Sometimes, unfortunately, also as Italy, the Italian society it is a little bit political, I'm sorry if I say this, but it's certainly an, a safeguard of our heritage. Giancarlo has been also the vice president years ago of it, so he was personally involved into it. It is nevertheless in some cases, and this breaks my heart to say it, sometimes an associations that should do more to protect our heritage are all communicated. Mm -hmm. So in our case, as I said, sadly enough, if I started my conversation criticizing that, we are responsible a lot of our own communication. I tell our story. I certainly tell the story of our territory. I would hope that this kind of DOCG will tell a little bit more the story to the benefit of everybody. I must say that at Pacenti, we are extremely proud, nevertheless, of the history of that because Giancarlo's father was actually one of the founding members of it in 1968. He was the last one alive uh, uh, up until last September, so it's one year that we lost uh, the father wow. of Giancarlo Siro. And he was a poor farmer at that time, part of this uh, new movement of creating and trying to value the Montalcino production and recognize it that the high quality production standards that you will expect from a DOCG. Uh, that sticker is a guarantee of quality, if you allow me for sure. Uh, for Montalcino is also an identity of territory and land of origin. So it has value and a broad stroke methodology for the consumer to feel like uh, that they're getting something of repute, maybe something of, um, of a standard. Standard. Standard is a good term. Absolutely. Well, we're at 51 minutes. The show's supposed to go 50. It airs uh, in different parts of the country on the radio, and they ask me to keep it to those times so that they can put in their promotions and stuff. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation, Christian. Thank you. You know, Paul. when you mentioned Bamfi, I had, I had her on the show. Uh, I think her name was Chris, Christina uh, May. Mariani. Yeah, May, right. <laughs> Mariana May, yeah. Um, uh, but fascinating. And I hope that my few days in between um, uh, our Tuscan tour and uh, Armenia, we can head up to Maltacino and, and see the winery and, and have a glass of wine. And I know you're not going to be there, but uh, I hope we'll so. miss you. I, ho <laughs> I hope for you to meet Giancarlo, a person that I'm honored to work with, a very humble person, but meeting him at the cellar in his in home ground. Yeah, so he's really a very great. different person than meeting him outside. Safe travels the rest of your trip. And thank you, uh, Paul. Thank you for being in here. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul, Callum, Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers.